All right, first of all, I think it should be very clear that the term ecological sustainability is out of our reach. Wow. And I think we got to forget about that and we got to call ecological survival. As Joris is very clear to point out, I want to take a holistic view of where we stand relative to a permatopia. What it does encompass is all of these blue boxes that are on the first slide. We're going to spend a little bit of time talking about the energy sector, the shelter sector, sector and how it interrelates with transportation. Take out your pencils because there are going to be some changes to this. <laughs> but we're talking about survival relative to the energy portfolio from a planet perspective, from a national perspective, and we're going to drive that all the way down to the community. And what are we going to do as a community to maintain a survival mode going forward? Considering the fact that we got two major problems. One is called peak oil, and the other is called climate change. And I think yours will be smiling. Next page. Here I have a breakdown of the 2008 Distribution of energy in the United States by technology, classical technology. These are all based on quads. A quad means quadrillion BTUs. That's 10 to the 15 BTUs equals one quad, just to give you a sense of what the amount of energy is. What's a BTU? A BTU is the amount of energy necessary to raise the temperature of one pound of water one degree Fahrenheit between 15 and 16 degrees. One BTU is equivalent to about half a Milky Way, 250 calories. So if you look on the left side, <laughs> if you look on the left side, there's roughly in 2008, 100 quads of energy generated in the United States based upon this distribution. Petroleum, roughly 37%, natural gas, Look at renewables at 7.3 quads. The way you read this, let's take renewable energy. 11% of those 7.3 quads went into transportation, and of the 27.8 quads of transportation energy used, 3% was generated by renewable energy. So you can see that we're somewhere in a, right now in 2010, 2011, between 100 and 104 quads of energy that are being used by the American people. Okay, next slide. This is called Hubbard's Peak. Yep. Hubbard, back in 1950, as a shell geologist said, if we keep consuming oil at the rate we are per capita, by 1971, the United States will be a peak, uh, peak usage. We will not be able to generate any more and we'll be on the decline. Guess what? He was right. He was right within two years. Everybody kerbunked him and said that he was crazy. What we have here is a total picture of what the oil content we're going to have going out for the next 25 to 50 years. What does that tell you? How does that translate to you as a human being? Well, you're paying gas at 269 a gallon if you're doing regular. Thankfully, if I got a Prius, I'm going to use more gallon, less gallons than you will. But the bottom line is, when gas goes to 9 to $10 a gallon, what are you going to do? Bottom line is, there's not going to be as many cars on the road. And you're going to have to find alternative means of transportation. We've got to start thinking about those things now, because this is going to happen for survival, not sustainability. Next, you'll see on a worldwide basis the amount of energy in million barrels per day that are being used by a country. A look at 2010. We're looking at somewhere in the vicinity at 85 million barrels of oil per day, besides what's going off into the Gulf of Mexico. Next slide. Here is a slide of Toyota. Toyota has said their calculations are based upon either expected a low scenario, high scenario, whatever the case may be, that we will hit peak oil somewhere around 2015. I think it's now. I think we've already done it. If you look at a website, uh, Alliance for the Study of Peak Oil, ASPO, you'll get everything you want to know about peak oil. These people know what they're talking about. Next slide. We're looking at the production of quads of energy in the United States going out. I don't have the 2010 data or the 9 data because EIA hasn't produced it yet. 
But in production, in the United States, 71. We imported 35. So we consumed about 100, 40% of that's petroleum. How much of it was renewables? We said 6 to 7%. Now let's look at transportation, as I mentioned in my first slide. Do you know that there are 244, in 2006, 244 million vehicles registered in the United States? They traveled 3 trillion miles in the United States. And everybody else wants a car, India, China, and so forth. So we consumed the heaviest 175 billion gallons of gasoline. Next slide is the distribution of automobiles, buses, and trucks, and so forth. If you leave out Puerto Rico, the grand total is 244 million. Puerto Rico adds another 2,446,000,000 million vehicles. And Detroit and the rest of the world would like to produce 15 million vehicles per year. So now we picture the fact that you've got 300 million vehicles out there in the United States, and you want to put an electric car out, you want to put a hydro car, but, uh, any kind of car. What is the conversion time to completely change the whole fleet from 300, 300 million? 20 years. <laughs> a little bit longer than that because of the fact that it's not every year. Now, I firmly believe that everybody who sits down and talks about energy or sustainability or survivability has got to look at the most important thing. We've talked about this over and over and over again. It's energy return on energy investing. We don't do this. The U.S. government, marketing people, all the guys that are out there manufacturing stuff never tell you what the real cost of something is. That includes PV. That includes wind turbines. All of the costs that are associated with getting you a product, whether it's coming from China or Bulgaria, does not take into effect the CO2 content generated by the manufacturing of that product, doesn't talk about all the inherent uh, contamination issues that go along with it. We need to start convincing the average American, which is a really serious problem, what it takes for them to get what they have. The, the best example is you pay two sixty five for a gallon of gasoline. Why not charge everybody $9 today? I'm all for it. First of all, it gets a lot of people off the road, puts a lot of bicycles back on the street. You don't mess up your roads as bad, and you actually are creating a better environment. If we could stop listening to government uh, contamination of what information we have, we would make the right decisions. But we're going to do it anyway at the grassroots level, and I'll show you how once I get through this. This next slide, energy, here's where you take out your pencil. First of all, we do not operate on an EROEI philosophy. We have to do that. I, ha I double-checked some of these things. NASA's Apollo Moon Project was $25.4 billion. That's $1969. The 2010 Federal Highway Budget is not 40 billion, it's 41.846 billion dollars. The cost of the Iraq war as of four o'clock this afternoon is 734 billion dollars and climbing. The cost of war in Afghanistan, 285 billion dollars. The savings alone debacle cost us, you, me, 153 billion dollars. Vietnam War, 111. Now let's talk about the government's mentality for energy development of technology by spending money with the National Renewable Energy Labs in Colorado, $141 million. What does that tell you? That is 14.2% of the total cost of building Yankee Stadium. To let that, rest his soul. Is that the only project that the government is spending money on for renewable energy, renewable energy? No, but the NREL which is the main organization for all renewable energy technology development, is getting pittance to do the work. Okay, Yankee Stadium, 1.3 billion. If you look at wind technology, biofuels, and solar, how much money was allocated, it is pathetic in the sense that the scoreboard at the new Dallas Stadium, you've heard about that HDV TV that's up there that everybody in the world can see, that costs $40 million. Where, what is the thinking going on here? This country spends more on sports than they do on survival and sustainability. 